Good afternoon. Today I'm going to talk to you about the effects of elevated carbon dioxide and ozone, as well as a combination of the two, on the movement of electrons between photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. Okay. Now all of this research links into the hot topic of climate change. And as we all know, we are experiencing currently an increase in the level of carbon dioxide level. So over here I've just uh, put, put a picture of you of where's the highest concentration of carbon dioxide uh, on the globe. And you will notice many of the carbon dioxide as, um, over here in Central America, the Amazons, the rainforests of Africa, and over Indonesia and China and Europe. Okay. So those are the places which have the highest levels of carbon dioxide. Okay. That is not surprising to me, okay, because um, it is very highly populated with plants. As you can see from this graph, um, from the early 1700s, the levels of, C of carbon dioxide increased to about a day of about 403.5 parts per million. And it is expected um, to increase a lot more. Okay. And the question everybody is asking, what is the influence of rising carbon dioxide levels on plants? Will it be a beneficial effect? Um, was, is this, will there be a negative effect? Okay. And there's a lot of debate around C4 plants versus um, C, uh, yeah, C3 plants versus C4, um, C4 plants. Okay, I'm not sure how well are you aware of ozone as a climate change problem. Okay, and this ozone is not the ozone um, high up in your atmosphere. We all know about that, the depleting ozone layer. This ozone is surface ozone. Okay. It is um, one of the world's most important air pollutant problems. Because, how is it formed? Okay. We have industries, we have cars, we have nitrogen oxides uh, being em emitted from the cars, uh, factories, we have volatile organic compounds, and all of these gases interact with one another in the presence of sunlight, and it creates surface ozone. And surface ozone is extremely dangerous for plant and animal life. And at the top, the red indicates the highest ozone levels in the world. And you will notice here, um, over here in the United States, and it looks like Texas is also included, uh, we have very high levels of ozone. Okay. This picture or this um, <coughs> diagram represents the um, summer months. In the winter months in South Africa, we have a hot spot over the southern part of um, Africa, basically from the equator southward. Why is that? We don't have any very big industries. We don't even have cities. Okay, it comes from the burning of the felt or, or of, of grasses, and these felt fires um, are deliberately made. So it's not a natural occurring thing. People go, they set a light. Um, um, the field and they burn the field and because of all of this smoke you get the formation of ozone okay so in the view to understand climate change we need to have a closer look at the process of photosynthesis why okay because very simple photosynthesis takes up carbon dioxide. It uses the carbon dioxide together with water and light to produce carbohydrates and oxygen is being emitted. Okay. And many mo modelers are currently, they want to determine how much carbon dioxide is currently in the atmosphere, how much of that carbon dioxide is being utilized, and what will carbon dioxide levels be in future. Now currently, um, they found out it is not that easy to do. They've done a lot of overestimation of it. 
And it's especially important for us to know how much carbon dioxide um, is taken up and how well the plant uses the carbon dioxide. So the objective of my study is to investigate the influence of elevated ozone, carbon dioxide, and a combination of ozone and carbon dioxide on the OJIP kinetics of two sugar cane cultivars. Okay. The OJIP kinetics, that uh, has to do with the flow of electrons between photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. Okay. We are dealing with plant stress, and something that we also have to keep in mind is plant stress is not always one stress at a time. If a plant is in an environment, they can um, experience one or more types of stress. So that's why we've done the combination of these two stresses. Okay, these experiments um, were done in these open top um, chambers at the University um, of the Northwest. Here's our university building. And, okay, um, yeah. <laughs> and Spotchestrum, okay, here's a map of South Africa, there's Johannesburg, and it's around about there. It's about an hour and a half's drive from Johannesburg, and it is a university town. Okay, so it's a very small town. If it's holiday and you've, you know, uh, st students have gone, the town is basically empty. Okay. So inside of these um, open top um, chambers, we have sensors, we can measure the humidity. We can measure the sunlight, um, we can me measure the airflow rate, we can measure the carbon dioxide levels and as well as the ozone. Okay. I've just put some um, diagrams here. Um, here's a temperature. Uh, this is the outside temperature, outside of the open tops, and inside the open tops there is our temperature. So inside the open tops it is a little bit warmer than outside. So the fumigation levels that we've decided on for carbon dioxide um, is between 750 and 800 parts per million. Uh, so it is quite a very high level of carbon dioxide. And for ozone, we have chosen 80 parts per billion um, of ozone, which is, according to global standards, actually very high. The international standard for ozone is about 40 parts per million. So everything above 40, we expect to get damage on the plant. Okay, so how do we investigate the flow of electrons inside the chloroplast? Okay, and that is done by the uh, by um, chlorophyll A fluorescence. Okay, and it's measured with this instrument. It's a handy P. P stands for plant efficiency analyzer. So basically what we do is uh, we, we give the, the leaves some light energy. Okay. And important at this uh, point is that your leaf has to be dark adapted. Okay. It's like a, 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 a gas petrol tank. You have to empty the petrol tank, then you give it some petrol and you see how well does the plant use um, that energy. Okay. And we get this emission of um, for red light, uh, greater than 690 nanometers, and that is our fluorescence signal. And this is what the signal looks like. We get something like this, what we call the OJIP curve, or the OJIP kinetics. And from this curve, we can get a wealth of information about the health status of the plot. Okay. To be able to understand or to interpret this curve, we just have to have a quick look at how does electrons flow within the thylakoid membrane. Okay. Basically, when you get some um, excitation of your chlorophyll pigment, and electron flows to firefighting, and from, from firefighting it gives the electron to q A, okay. um, and q A minus um, forms. And from QM, it gives uh, um, the electron to quinone B. Before quinone B can give its electron to plus to quinone, it has to receive two electrons from quinone A. Okay. After quinone B has received two electrons, it picks up two e electrons from the stroma, um, 
and plastic key null is being formed. Okay. And plastic key null is one of your electron carriers, and the electron is carried um, to photosystem one. Okay. So over here we have photosystem two and photosystem one, and we have the flow of electrons through this system. So by analyzing this OGIP transient, we can get different information about uh, how the electrons flow within the thylakoid membrane. Now, I like to view the OGIP transient um, to this cardiogram. If you are sick, what do you do? You go to the doctor, he measures your heart rate, or he measures uh, your, your heart rate, or he measures your blood pressure. Okay. This technique can do the same. Okay, so if a plant is sick, you can take a measurement and you get your OGIP curve and you can determine how well the plant is or how sick it is or what is the, um, the severity of the stress. And by studying the kinetics and the shape of this OGIP curve, you can get that kind of information. Okay. So over here is um, the OGIP graph that I've gotten from my experiment. So initially, if you, if you look at this graph, you won't see any differences. But as your fumigation progresses, you can see that the, that the differences between the OJIP transients become more evident. But still, looking at this, uh, it doesn't tell you much. Okay? You have to um, go deeper into the kinetics of this graph. And to do that, there's a whole set of different formulations that you can do. Okay. And basically what this calculation tell you is, how well does a plant absorb sunlight energy? Okay. How well does a plant store that energy? And how well does a plant utilize that energy? Okay, so I've done some few calculations and I have drawn what we call the relative variable fluorescent um, graphs from the OJIP transient. Okay. So first of all, we have analyzed between um, the O and the J steps. Okay, so that is from 0 0.03 milliseconds and 2 milliseconds on our OJIP graph. Okay. And the information that we get is um, what we call the delta L and the delta K bands. Okay. Um, the delta L, that is the overall grouping probability within photosystem 2 antenna, and the delta K is the efficiency of the oxygen evolving complex. Okay. So over here we have um, the one sugarcane cultivar and um, the second one, and we have compared the two, uh, oh yeah, we, we have compared these two cultivars. And I want to point out is this red line over here, these red dots, okay? That is our 750 parts per million carbon dioxide level, okay? Just to make the uh, interpreting of this graph easier, okay? Graphs at the bottom, okay? We have normalized it uh, to our control. There's our control. These graphs at the bottom of the graph, in other words, a negative uh, delta graph, that in indicates a stimulation effect or a more effective process in comparison to the control. Anything above this line means um, that the process is inhi inhibited or one of, of your electron carriers is accumulating. So very early on, um, we can see that over here, uh, we have the formation of a delta K band. Okay? So that means the inefficiency of the oxygen evolving complex. So there's a problem uh, over there. But with the ozone and with the combination effect, we get a stimulating effect of our oxygen evolving complex. So in theory, it is working better than we expected. Okay. With cultivar N31, we get a delta L band over here. And that has to do with the overall grouping. Okay. So that's a negative sign. So something happens over here which influence, influences the connectivity of 
the PAS2 antenna. And that is not surprising that we get it from our ozone treatment. Okay. So just comparing these two graphs um, to one another, we can already see that cultivar N31 is more susceptible to ozone damage than cultivar um, NC0378. Okay. So what is the purpose of this? Okay. This is for plant breed. So if you want to um, breed a plant for ozone resistance, you can use this information by selecting um, different cultivars. An advantage of this is um, you can detect a change before visual symptoms set in. So instead of doing a, a trial for a 12-month period, you can do it a trial for um, three months, and you can get your answer. If we have a look between uh, the two milliseconds and 300 milliseconds, we get um, information about um, QB minus, QB2 minus, and plus two, K null. And again, with the NC0378, we have the accumulation of K known B minus. So in other words, the electrons travel until QB minus, and that's where it stops. The electrons isn't given over to plastokinone um, to get plastokinol being formed. Okay, and uh, over here we get a delta G band as well. The delta G band is um, the accumulation of plastokinol. Okay. If you compare this to cultivar N31, you can see that uh, elevated carbon dioxide early on during electron transport has a slightly positive effect, but later on we have the formation of a delta G band. But surprising as well with this cultivar is our ozone treatment, uh, a negative delta H band. The delta H band is uh, or, uh, the f function of QB2 minus. So that means that electrons are moving more effectively beyond um, Q known B minus. Okay. And we can do the same between 0 0.3 and 30 um, milliseconds. Okay. Uh, we have the J band. The J band is an indication of Q known A. So with elevated carbon dioxide levels in cultivar NC0378, we get the accumulation of uh, QNON A minus, whereas in cultivar N31, uh, we get a more better flow of the movement of QNON of, of electrons beyond Q, um, QA minus. Okay. This is a uh, C4 plant. And according to literature, what is the effect of elevated carbon dioxide on C4 plants? Okay. Previously, they thought it doesn't have any effect. Okay. But over here, we can clearly see um, that uh, carbon dioxide can influence the two cultivars differently. Okay. So with the one cultivar, we can have a, a stimulating effect in the process, and the other one, we can have an inhibiting effect. Looking at the total overall process, we can now uh, uh, get a much bigger picture of what's happening in total. Okay. So, NC0376, negative effect of high carbon dioxide levels. Cultivar N31 have a stimulating effect. Okay. With cultivar N31, we have a stimulating effect with the ozone as well, or um, with the combined effect of um, carbon dioxide and ozone. Surprisingly, with cultivar NCO376, when we've uh, measured this tomato conductance, 
with a 750 parts per billion and the combination effect, we have an increase in the stomatal conductors, which means the plant is able to better absorb carbon dioxide. Okay. So if we go back to the previous one, if the plant is able to absorb more carbon dioxide, we expect a, stimulate, a stimulating effect on the process of photosynthesis, don't we? But we are actually seeing now the opposite. Okay. In this case, uh, the higher your carbon dioxide, the more negative it is for the plant. Okay. With cultivar N31, uh, we did not um, um, get any significant differences uh, between the stomatal conducts, conductance of the two plant. Okay. And we can see that the response is totally different compared to NCO376. Okay, here I have just compared the two cultivars to one another early on during the experiment and um, later on. And I want to highlight this one. This is the, um, the effect of 80 parts per billion carbon dioxide, which has an extremely negative effect on the photosynthetic process. Whereas here at the bottom um, is also a combined uh, effect, but this is of N31. So N31 um, over here, stimulating process, N31 over here, and inhibiting process. Okay, so there's definitely a difference in the two cultivars in terms of their response. So the effects of uh, ozone and carbon dioxide on plants are variety dependent. NCO376 is photosynthetically a much better perf performer under high CO2 levels compared to N31. So if you're an agriculturist, you want to go for that cultivar. There are no significant differences in the photosynthetic responses between the two cultivars when fumigated with um, ozone. Most probably the AOT40 does not apply to plants in southern Africa, and we find this now with various studies. Okay. If we expose plants to 40 parts per billion in South Africa, they are not damaged. We have to go very high, 80 parts per billion to 100 parts per billion. And the most likely cause of this is uh, most likely the um, ability to resist drought conditions, which relate to the opening and closing of the stomata. The JIP test is a useful, fast, non destructive destructive tool to screen for cultivars that are more suitable to grow under various climate conditions. So I think this tool is it's a, a very nice tool to use. Um, you need some training to use it, but if you have a training, it is easy and you can get useful information. So for plant breeders that wants to breed for a specific stress, you can get an early result early on and don't have to go through the entire process. From a plant physiology um, uh, point of view, it's an amazing tool to study the redox potential of the light-driven photosynthetic responses. Okay. Then I just need to uh, acknowledge some of my co-workers and sponsors, uh, especially the South African Synthetic Oil and Liquid Corporation and the South African Sugarcane Research Institute. Thank you. The paper is open for discussion. Questions? Going Everyone's once. happy with what Jacques said? Going once. <laughs> he has a question right here. Where? Here, right here. Here. There we go. Can you clarify what is O3, what we know that which will prevent the ultraviolet radiation from the higher altitudes? The O3 that you are mentioning on the above the soil surface. What is the general concentration of the O3 in a normal On atmosphere? Okay, in parts of Sturm, it's about six parts per billion. PPB, six PPB. Six parts per billion, okay. If you go to your cities, okay, um, Europe um, especially, it can go up to about 80 parts per billion, and this is an hourly rate, okay. 
in China, um, uh, I think there was a recording that can go up to about 100 parts per billion. Okay, but remember, it's an hourly rate, so it goes up and it goes down again quite fast. Okay, I'm not sure what the global uh, average is. Okay, but for the Northern Hemisphere, um, well, let's, let's say for um, Europe uh, and United States, and I think China as well. Okay, the cut-off line is uh, 40 parts per billion. Going over um, those levels, you'll start getting damage to your crops. Again, second point related to this. So, <coughs> sugarcane being the C4 plant, which yes. is photosynthetic efficient. So, what will be the status of the O3 in the global warming situation? The O3 level will increase or decrease in the global okay. warming situation? Um, on a global scale, <laughs> You have to be area specific. Okay, so for for South Africa, um, you cannot say forty parts per billion um, is dangerous for the plants. So you have to up your, your scales. Let's say to sixty or um, seventy. Um, but for Europe, it it will stay uh, forty. So you have to look at specific region how the plant is adapted to that region to deal with those kind um, of stress. But that is for plants. Now you have to take human beings, animals into consideration as well. And for most living uh, um, organisms, above 40 is dangerous. So I can't see. Um, so I think globally, it will stay at at 40. Uh, 